Welcome to the Happy Dog, Happy Human podcast, where we explore the intersection between human mental health and our relationships with dogs. We hope you enjoy today's episode. Hi, I'm Sharon. I'm a human animal bond facilitator and bite prevention strategist. I'm the founder of Human Canine Collaborative, through which I support humans and dogs in trauma recovery and nervous system healing through cultivating embodied attunement and somatic consent lifestyle practices. I'm also a licensed occupational therapist and hold a doctorate in occupational therapy with advanced clinical practice in community-based mental health. For the past 15 years, I have been working as a dog trainer and canine behavior consultant, specializing in public safety and dog bite prevention, animal-assisted interventions, including activities and education with special populations, and rehabilitation for anxious, reactive, and traumatized dogs. Hi, I'm Angela, the CEO of Cloud Doodles. We are a company that raises awareness about the benefits of dogs on mental health. We sell meaningful dog and human accessories to support our platform and to be able to give 25% of our profits to animal, dog, and mental health related charities. All of our patterns have a special mental health meaning and are designed and hand drawn by me. I believe that every human and dog should be privy to the unconditional love they provide for each other. I hold a BA in studio arts and a master's of social work. I am a licensed clinical social worker in the state of California where I specialized in homelessness and severe mental illness. I currently reside in Italy with my poodle mix duchess, my husband, and toddler. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi, world. Welcome to our um, third episode. Um, This week's episode is going to be about PTSD, which is an acronym for post-traumatic stress disorder, a um, diagnostic statistical manual, also known as the DSM uh, diagnosis. And uh, we will be covering, um, talking about what it looks like in humans mostly today, focusing on that, and also how dogs can help uh, people with PTSD and what that looks like. Um, So before we start anything, we're going to, or before we start our discussion, we're going to do our pre-care exercise, which we do every week. And uh, we hope you guys um, can use these exercises outside of this podcast and uh, practice them for centering. So this week, um, I am going to do a very simple breathing exercise that helps um, uh, with resetting your nervous system and also connecting your left and right brain. Okay, so uh, close your eyes. And I want you to Imagine breathing in through your right nostril and breathing out through the left. And again, breathe in through your right nostril and breathe out through the left. And one more time, breathe in through the right and breathe out through the left. And now we're gonna switch. Breathe in through the left nostril and out through the right. In through the left, out through the right. In through the left out through the right. And on three, we're going to open our eyes. One, two, three. Super simple. Another variation of it is also that you can hold one nostril while you're breathing in and then hold the other nostril while you breathe out. Um, But I personally like to do it without holding because it takes more of my concentration. So I find it more helpful for myself um, Mm -hmm. to find grounding in that um, because I have to focus on it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd never done it 
but without holding the nostrils before. And I was like, really uh, pleased and surprised how much I had to focus. I kind of like went into a, it looked like a cartoon in my head, like with these like, arrows of air going up through my nose. Oh, like, I love the that. Other way. Yeah. Like as if I were watching like a, a science show about how air goes through the nose or something. <laughs> yeah. It's weird because it, you're also kind of using your imagination because it's obviously not possible to completely do that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just, I personally like that better than the, the touching um, mm -hmm. each nostril closed because of the imagination that goes into it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. You're welcome. And that's a really good one actually for sleep. That's where I learned it was mm -hmm. through a sleep podcast because you know, when you're doing meditations to sleep, uh, you, sh it it's best if you're laying with, you know, on your back with your arms out, not that you're moving. So uh, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Um, all right, so let's start talking about PTSD. Um, I think it's a very important topic and also a very complex topic in many different ways. Um, so before we talk about PTSD, I actually want to start about talking talking about trauma mm. in general and what that is and what it means. Um, so we all have experienced trauma. Um, it could even be as early as being in the womb. Mm. Um, you can experience trauma in utero. Uh, if your, um, your host, your mother <laughs> was uh, experiencing, um, you know, uh, emotional problems or environmental issues, for example, um, maybe in a bad relationship, like there's so many different things that could affect you. Uh, while you are in uterus, um, maybe secondhand smoke is an example, maybe an accident though. Maybe you fell, your mom, you know, fell and, and bumped um, her tummy. There are many different things that uh, we don't realize are affecting fetuses in, in utero um, or we don't think about um, um, while they're in there. Mm -hmm. And then I would say that birth is a trauma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As someone who has given birth, I can definitely attest to birth being a trauma for both the mm -hmm. mother and also the baby. <laughs> yeah. And going through the birth canal is traumatic. And there are various degrees of that, of course. Um, but coming into this world is, is scary. The first time you come in, um, uh, it's a new it's a whole new world. You're breathing for the first time. You just got smushed out mm. of the birth canal. Um, I could go on and on and on for one. <laughs> it's a traumatic moment, but yeah. it is. And it's not something that we always think of. Mm -hmm. um, so there are different kinds of trauma. Also, you have little T traumas, which are small traumatic events that happen over and over and over again and they can compound over time which can lead to PTSD. Um, examples of that could be uh, verbal abuse from a parent so maybe they call you stupid mm -hmm. here and there but it happens so frequently and for so long that that becomes a you know traumatic event in total. So little T traumas, um, and then we talk about big T traumas. Just because it's a little T doesn't mean it's any uh, less than the big T traumas. It's just smaller events. Like they may seem in insignificant, but they're not, and they mm -hmm. compound over time. Mm -hmm. So that's um, important to think about. So maybe a kid also in school, I'll give that an example, is being bullied, but being called names. Um, so that's not a huge traumatic event, but it's something that's occurring so often that it can neg negatively affect them over time. Mm. Um, so the big T traumas are big events that happen. So for example, sexual assault is a big T trauma. Um, a natural disaster is a big T trauma. A car accident is a big T trauma. So these are I think what we more typically think of as, a, you know, in, in the, the general public thinks of as traumatic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Can I yeah. jump in? I want to yes, know, um, 
I was thinking about, yeah, I really appreciate the explanation of the how smaller events can be traumatic and, and big events can be traumatic. And I'm thinking, I was thinking like, what is the underlying theme? And, and that is, I think, that your survival is threatened, both with the small events and with the big events. And the small events, the life threat isn't necessarily that there is something happening that is immediately threatening your life or your safety, but it's something that, like in the examples you gave with being bullied or being verbally accosted by a parent, those are experiences that threaten your sense of belonging or your relationship to a group or to people who can help you survive. And so that is a threat to survival. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and also as, as a child, your parents, your whole, your life relies on your parent. Like you need, yeah. you need them to survive. Yeah. Um, and I think what you're saying is true too of groups, especially mm -hmm. when you're young, like your peers are, we wouldn't survive without socializing. So if we're put in a situation where we're trapped, mm -hmm. quote unquote trapped, that's very pessimistic of me, but it's true <laughs> that you're trapped with your parents and mm -hmm. they are treating you in a way that is traumatic over time, you have no way out. Yeah. And so that can result in PTSD. Mm -hmm. So moving into PTSD is a reaction, I would say, and even a brain, your brain gets rewired physically as a result of these traumatic events or event that has occurred. Mm -hmm. And there are different reasons for why this might happen mm -hmm. um, before I so I will give a big example, actually, where they, they, after September 11th, they did a study to see who developed PTSD and who didn't that was in the towers. Um, and what they discovered was that the people who went home to their families who had support were less likely to develop PTSD compared to those who were isolated. So for example, who, you know, didn't have family or friends to talk about what had happened or to feel loved or belong, like they belonged somewhere. So those people were at higher risk for developing PTSD. A couple other things came out of that too, though, not just that they, uh, um, if you've had previous traumas, you're at risk for developing PTSD. So if, um, you know, for example, I think of like a firefighter or a police officer in the Twin Towers um, who had, who were first responders, they may have already experienced trauma previously. Mm -hmm. um, witnessing trauma is also um, a criteria for developing PTSD. So it doesn't necessarily just have to happen to you. And many first responders are constantly witnessing traumatic events occur. So that's an example, again, like let's say a police officer then goes into the Twin Towers and they have all this history of witnessing traumas, they might be at higher risk of developing PTSD mm -hmm. as well. That makes sense, yeah. So that's another risk factor. Um, Did they say enough. anything about um, a sense of control? and how yeah. that affects development of PTSD. Yeah, and I, I actually would go into that in a, in a different way. Like we can attack that from a different way. So what happens, why your brain actually changes um, and de to develop PTSD, uh, one of the symptoms is hypervigilance. And so when we have hypervigilance, our uh, bodies, a nervous system, which we talk about on here a lot, are out of whack and they, our nervous system thinks we're in danger all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost like this traumatic event that occurred or the many little traumas that occurred made the person feel so unsafe, like physically, emotionally, spiritually, that they are constantly on a uh, fight or flight freeze mode. Ooh, wow. So I think the sense of control plays into that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so let's take the, you're a kid example and you're in an abusive environment. You rely on your parents for survival and you can't get out. Mm-hmm. And so your fight flight freeze response is, um, dialed up. Mm-hmm. And it, when you're a kid, it's especially difficult because your brain is developing. Yeah. So your brain is now developing into this, uh, hyper arousal state. Mm, interesting. Constantly. Yeah. Yeah. Since you're very young. Um, mm-hmm. And so the, the fight flight freeze also plays an important role in how PTSD looks like from one person to the other, mm-hmm. because you respond either by running away, by fighting or by freezing. Mm-hmm. And I think a very common one in children, for example, because they are completely, um, unable I mean they're unable to fight or flight basically so they freeze and they tend to dissociate so that's another symptom that we see a lot uh, in PTSD Um, dissociation is basically a separation from reality it's a bit hard to describe actually Mm -hmm. Um, yeah but it's you're getting stuck in your head and you can't feel your body yeah or you're like seeing yourself from above yeah, um, a like lot of floating. people, des- like floating. Yeah, a lot of people describe it like that, yeah. um, or imagining that you're somewhere else because you can't get out of the situation. Um, mm-hmm. I think a lot of a lot of sexual assault survivors, if you talk to the, if you talk to them, they said like, okay, I was trying to just not be there, mm-hmm. and that is a form of dissociation, and then it can become something that continues to occur as time goes on, Mm -hmm. especially if it's chronic and you're young and you're being sexually assaulted Mm -hmm. a lot. And then, so your brain just deals with the trauma by, by cutting itself out of reality Mm -hmm. in the situation. It's how it protects itself. Yeah. Yeah. So you're like disconnecting your mind from the experience of what's happening to your body. Right. And, and then, you know, I, I want to say this because it, it serves a purpose in that moment, but then later on as an adult, when, um, you're still dissociating, but like, you're not in danger anymore, it's not serving mm-hmm. you anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. so this fight, flight, freeze response is very important. We need it mm-hmm. to, to survive. Um, you know, I think another one immediately I think about is, you know, when we think about PTSD again, and in, in sort of the gen in general, we think a lot, first thing that comes up is veterans, right? Yeah. Of war. Mm-hmm. So they have a similar thing. They're in a fight, flight, freeze response or, or situation constantly, but they have to learn to fight because if they don't, they're mm-hmm. going to get killed and mm-hmm. it serves a response. It serves them in that moment. Yeah. But then when they're back in society and they get triggered by something they fight and that's not appropriate in that situation um Mm -hmm. for them or for you know whoever is on the receiving end of it that makes a lot of sense to me what you're talking about how the freezing for example serves a purpose when you're young but then when you're older your body has learned to do this and then gets triggered to do it and do it over and over Um, anyways i've had that experience myself So when I was young, I experienced like traumatic situations and I developed a freeze response. That was my body's like go-to response in the situations that I was in. And for me, it was like, I remember feeling like I was paralyzed or like I was trapped somehow inside my body and I couldn't say anything. And it was a lot of situations where I was supposed to be saying something, but I just couldn't. And, and I would remember like almost screaming at myself inside my head, like say something, but I couldn't either. I couldn't think of anything to say or everything I thought of to say didn't sound right. Or it sounded like it would make things worse or get me more in trouble or whatever the situation was. So I developed this really strong freeze response that would happen so often. It was looking back now, I think. I probably qualified for uh, selective mutism diagnosis, like it was that intense. And so I grew up and like got to be known as this like quiet, difficult child, <laughs> you know. And then 
um, I, I wasn't aware of this, so I couldn't like name it. I couldn't describe it. I didn't know how to get help for it. And then when I was in grad school, it started happening in professional situations, just like things would trigger me and I would freeze. And it would be like, I'm with colleagues or peers or something. I'm supposed to be answering a question or whatever, and I can't say anything. And so I started uh, going to therapy and getting help for it at that point. Um, and I didn't realize until I had been in therapy a while that this freeze response was a was a necessary and even smart response that helped me to survive when I needed it to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it's that's sort of what we were saying, like as a child, you you need to do that a lot of the times in most situations, right? Like if something mm-hmm. triggering or traumatic is happening, it's it's the only way it's the only way out, I guess, mm-hmm. is to freeze. Um, thank you for sharing. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I also, I think that this particular response is probably one of the most difficult ones to work with, actually, the freeze response. Um, and I think it's because of that feeling of like, that there's no control. So I'm just going to sort of just disappear, I guess, in, in to your head or outside mm-hmm. of your body. Because if you fight or flee, you know, it, I'm not saying it's any better, but you have a sense of control that you were able to get out or that you were able to, you know, do something about it, basically. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes the freeze is like, is the only option, but it's also, it's not something you're consciously choosing. No, you know, it's like your body is recognizing that this is what's needed. This is the best way to survive right now. You know, Absolutely. like I can remember being in a conversation with my employer and freezing and like, could I have yelled at them? Sure. But maybe I would have lost my job or right. like, could I have just left? Yes, I could have quit the job, but then I would not have a job. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't have income. I wouldn't have colleagues, you know, and belonging. So then freezing was what my body did. And I kept my job a little bit longer and was able to survive, you know, doing that. It wasn't a yeah. good existence at the time, but. But it's the, the strange thing about it is, is that it's almost like the socially acceptable form of dealing with trauma. Yeah. Yeah. And less, and actually, I would like to say that it's gendered too, because I think it's a socially mm-hmm. acceptable form for women <laughs> to mm-hmm. deal with trauma. Yeah. And for men, it's more socially acceptable to be aggressive, like going back to the veteran example. Um, you know, I think that's why they men tend to lash out in, in aggressiveness um, mm-hmm. more than other, um, I mean, when they can, and more than other. Uh, ways when they're triggered by a trauma response Mm -hmm. yeah which you know of course that's very painful too I think for men um I don't think they I mean I would like to think most don't want to to lash out and be aggressive and Mm -hmm. um you know but this is a different discussion about just like toxic gender roles in general Mm -hmm. yeah yeah absolutely I never thought of that but thanks for mentioning that yeah we might tend to go toward a a certain response because that's what's accepted for whatever category we're placed in yeah absolutely Mm -hmm. and I want to ask you actually because you mentioned that you were diagnosed with complex PTSD Mm -hmm. what does that mean um compared mm-hmm. to regular PTSD? Like what is, and then what does that look like for you or mean to you? Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. Yeah, I just received that diagnosis this year and it was really validating because I had, you know, everybody's tra- trauma is different and everybody's story is different. And I had this uh, belief of myself that like, oh, my stuff wasn't as bad as other people's, you know, stuff. So complex PTSD, from my understanding, it occurs when somebody has experienced multiple traumas and usually some are occurring in very early childhood 
And then some are occurring either later during development or in adulthood. And it's that compounding that like adding those together almost that the later traumas are impacted by the earlier trauma and also impact the response to the earlier trauma. Mm, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, it, so it's like the little T traumas from childhood and then you have more of those, but as an adult, and then it's just all being triggered back and forth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And in my experience, I've found that because of the traumas I experienced as a child, I developed certain, um, I guess, ideas about how to be in relationship with other people. You know, like you're either, I guess, after you've experienced trauma, you're either in trauma mastery, which is like you're unconsciously seeking out situations that were similar to your trauma so that you can do something this time or like master the skills to make it better for either yourself or somebody else. And so the traumas I experienced when I was little contributed to me being in environments when I was adult that uh, caused me to experience additional similar traumas. That's really interesting. And I also think that that happens a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that even happens with people who don't have a PTSD diagnosis, because like I was saying earlier, we all have trauma. And so we're all, mm -hmm. we often try to reenact um, like whatever we experience as children that was difficult or, adver you know, whatever adversity you yeah. experience, you're trying to, to uh, make it better as an adult where you have more control and maybe you can act it out. Mm -hmm. um and you actually get the result that you want mm -hmm. yeah um but uh oh I lost my train of thought <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> that's okay <laughs> what was I gonna say it was related to you but now I forgot um oh well I wanted to ask you so um what how else do these symptoms play out for you because we're we talked mm -hmm. about hypervigilance mm -hmm. um then we talked about dissociating or like for some people running away or, or having an aggressive response, but for you, it's dissociating. What other things um, are affected or do you notice affect your functioning on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, sleep and eating get really impacted. So when I first developed the complex PTSD, I had a really hard time sleeping and eating. I guess I would say some of the first physiological symptoms or body symptoms were happening right after grad school. So like there's this weird thing that can happen where if you're in a prolonged stressful or traumatic situation, you're kind of like fueled by adrenaline to get through it. But then after it's over, that's when your body breaks down because it's like now you're safe and your body can rest or be ill or be vulnerable. So that was what happened to me after grad school. I got really sick and my whole nervous system was just like almost like short circuited, like didn't have a rhythm anymore. So I had a hard time falling asleep. I would wake up too early. So I was in this high state of arousal that wouldn't allow me to fall asleep and rest. Um, my, I would be sitting down and my heart would just start racing all of a sudden or I would not be hungry in the morning, or I would wake up nauseous, or certain things would make me gag really easily. Like I would be brushing my teeth and just like gag all of a sudden, um, or I would have like a burning, uh, really painful burning sensation in my digestion. So all of those uh, physiological symptoms, which thankfully now they have, I have things uh, back in a rhythmic state and I feel more healthy and under control, but in the beginning, it was a lot of just trying to get through the day, trying to sleep, trying to eat. Trying to survive. Yeah. 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 That's, um, it's interesting. It made me think about how for some people who have repressed traumatic memories when they, uh, it often, when they get to a certain age, if it's happened to them as children, mm -hmm. when they get around 30, Mm -hmm. um, and things might be stabling out, like they're more in a safe place, like what you were describing, then the memories come flooding back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. 
so that's another like another piece of it but it's almost like for you it was like your body the memory in your body was coming back right yes exactly flooding back like there's something wrong here there's something wrong here listen to me you know Mm -hmm. I don't feel safe and that's that's your body telling you um that it's not feeling good and that it it needs help because we have that connection of course and I think PTSD out of all of the diagnoses really really highlights the mind-body connection Mm -hmm. um that they're it's just they're yeah they're you cannot treat one without the other they go together Mm -hmm. um And that's really, really important um, to remember. I mean, with anything, of course, holistic, a holistic approach is really important, but I think that we see it very well in that. Yeah, I agree. I think, yeah, PTSD is in the body and the brain is in the body too. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, like I think that experience for me really highlighted how much I didn't have a relationship with my body or Mm -hmm. I didn't have a healthy one you know, which was partially because of all the freezing that I, I'd been in a freeze state to varying degrees throughout my entire development. And so I couldn't feel my body. Like people would ask, like, what do you feel in your body? I'd be like, nothing. I, (laughs) there's nothing. I don't know. (laughs) Um, so there was that disconnection, but then also me trying to master my previous trauma or subconsciously being in environments or putting myself in environments where I would be traumatized again was a was me not listening to my body and not honoring what my body needed and not caring for my body in a way that allowed me to survive and thrive. Yeah, absolutely. Which I think is part of the trauma because whatever happened also, you know, there's definitely, I think a lot of trauma survivors in generally talk about um, a, a feeling of low self-worth and whatever happened is also what led them to feel that way. So then it's like, why take care of myself if I'm not worth anything? Yeah. Um, So I think that's a common, common experience also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can attest to that. I definitely experienced that, especially with the freeze, because I think part of the reason was because, well, because I would get punished for it as a kid, (laughs) but also because in our world, we, um, we value humans, right? We value humans more than other types of life. And the reason we say that humans are worth more is because we can speak in words, we can write in words, we can think in words, right? And then here I am developing into a person who can't speak, Mm. you know? And like, so I just believed I was worthless, like that I was, uh, you know, I was nothing. I was stupid. I was pathetic, you know, because I couldn't do something so simple that everyone else can do, which is right. Right. And there's a huge value also placed on like socializing and talking and, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, being outgoing or even extroverted. Like, I think that's something that if you're not those things and you don't fit that box, then you feel like you're not yeah, like you're not worthy or that you're not doing human right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? there's something wrong with you. <laughs> Especially as a kid, I can imagine that, that because there's so much pressure of like, go play with your friends, go be with people, but you might not want to also, yeah, or you, don't you know? Yeah. Um, I think that's what drew me to dogs. That's what like um, allowed my relationship with dogs to begin to flourish and to begin to uh, be something that was so meaningful in my life because I didn't have to talk to the no. dog. And know? they don't it's judge just, you also for, yeah. for that. Yeah. They, also, they like it better. Yeah, <laughs> they do. So <laughs> they do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and then you feel seen and also you see, you see them. Um, yeah. and I can see actually now that you're saying this, that, you know, they can't speak and, and so much of your work is you want to give them a voice. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. a, also a projection. Of right. What I happened to you? To, I want people to recognize that language is not only words. Yes, that's that's a much language can be that, yeah. action. Language can be smells. Language can be um, making sounds, but not words. They and honestly, hard. those are probably more reliable than words because words, especially adults. Um, mm-hmm their words are not always reliable. 
yeah yeah action speaks stronger than words <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and our, yeah. our words don't always match our actions no they don't they don't and you don't have that with dogs i mean they can't speak but they're pretty transparent and authentic yeah. and there's nothing there's nothing uh that they're hiding i guess of who mm -hmm. they are unless yeah. they're trying to get on your table to eat your food that you left out there <laughs> but that's the more of the thief mentality <laughs> They're, they're just not really themselves. trying to hide it. <laughs> yeah. I want that chicken. I'm going to get it. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get it when they're not looking. <laughs> um, but their, their need there is pretty authentic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, I also, one last thing before maybe talking a little bit about how dogs play a role in all of this. Um, mm -hmm. I did want to talk about uh, environmental trauma and community trauma being mm -hmm. a risk factor for PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, when I think of environmental, I actually, first thing that's coming to my mind right now is even global warming and how we're mm -hmm. all being exposed to that and mm -hmm. traumatic things that are happening as a result, including huge natural disasters, um, but also just in general, like air quality, for example, the air quality that we're breathing in, that's a trauma that is happening to all of us um mm. or it's something that may give us adversity in the long run uh if we don't want to use that word trauma necessarily in this situation mm -hmm. um but also on a community level people who are living in um, dangerous neighborhoods dangerous countries um, are being persecuted by their governments um, for the color of their skin or the religion that they practice, um, whatever that may be on a bigger societal level, mm -hmm. this is a continuous trauma mm -hmm. to be experiencing. And it does put you at risk for developing PTSD. Mm, um, that's such a good point. Yeah. And I would say to reframe, um, the idea that certain neighborhoods are dangerous like, I'm so glad that you brought up um, like race and um, authoritarian persecution and, and things like that, racialized trauma as a contributor to PTSD, because I think that it's not necessarily that someone is living in a dangerous neighborhood or, you know, like the way this is, the way the society is, has developed in America, people with black skin or people who are indigenous um, are forced or have been forced to live in certain places where they're cut off from resources or they're um, over-policed and over, um, we have a, like the, the authoritarian has a hypervigilance on those communities. And so therefore trauma is being caused by the structure of the society, um, not necessarily that the neighborhood is dangerous because that's where all of the black or impoverished people live, but it's dangerous because they're cut off from resources and they are over-policed and um, ostracized from society. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's very complicated. Also, I was even thinking about like cut, cut off from resources as even a lot of those neighborhoods. I, I think the best way maybe to talk about it is just low income neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, so in those low income neighborhoods, or I'm even thinking in impoverished countries, mm -hmm. like poverty mm -hmm. is, is really the, the trauma because of all these things that occur. So like mm -hmm. you have uh, over policing or you have a bad relationship with authorities in mm -hmm. those neighborhoods, or mm -hmm. I mean, some countries you have dictators and like that mm -hmm. in itself is traumatic. Um, but I'm th in America specifically, we can narrow down on that, that it's, you, there's a bad relationship with people that you're supposed, that are supposed to be protecting you and they're not. Um, mm -hmm. You don't have access to healthy foods, which mm -hmm. is traumatic for your body or any food. Mm -hmm. um, talk about air quality. Most of these impoverished neighborhoods are the ones suffering the mm -hmm. most from globalization or pff, globalization from uh climate change yeah um you know maybe there's a lot of trash or there it's in an undesirable geographic location mm -hmm, where they uh, can farm or get fresh water exactly. 
Mm-hmm. Exactly. Or there's extreme heat or like even in, um, I was exactly. reading about uh, environmental, I forget what it's called. anyways impoverished neighborhoods generally have less trees less greenery so they have less access to shade so when it's hot they suffer more and they can't they don't have air conditioning or access to resources that would allow them to stay cool or to keep their families cool and safe exactly and of course like we can't you know I think where I when I think of the reason I said dangerous neighborhoods also is of course we can't deny that like crime rates are much higher um, in in, uh, poor countries or neighborhoods. And that of course Mm -hmm. is gonna put you in a fight flight response. And most of the people in those neighborhoods are not committing the crimes, but they are Mm -hmm. exposed to it. So they're exposed to witnessing things like homicide. They're exposed to being afraid and that someone's going to break in and all the time and they they don't have the protection of the police for example so Mm -hmm. their experience of witnessing trauma or actually having a traumatic thing done to them is much higher Mm -hmm. in their everyday lives so they're going to be they're going to be uh more in that hypervigilant state and you know i do want to say again though like not everybody in these situations develop PTSD. Yeah. This is just a, ric- a risk factor. Mm. Um, and I think that's important because we also don't wanna like, well, I don't know if I wanna say this actually, um, but I, I just think it's important to distinguish between that. And actually to end kind of on a lighter, not to end, but to switch into a little bit of a lighter um, way of thinking about trauma um, mm. because we all have it but we can also experience trauma and uh, find strength through trauma. And you can actually have a positive uh, response to trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the uh, interesting thing that they're starting, I forget the name, but when we think of it, we'll put it back in here, but there is research being done on vets Mm. about why some vets take their war experience and actually spin it Mm. or reframe it into a positive thing that happened Mm -hmm. versus uh one that leads to the experience of constant fear Mm -hmm. of the world what what is going on there and i think a lot of therapies aim to help someone with ptsd uh reframe or or get the narrative back for themselves mm-hmm. so they can mm-hmm. feel in control again of what occurred to them and safe again yeah 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 so like res- building resilience um after right trauma. right exactly so like mm-hmm. and there are such thing also other research that shows in childhood you want positive stress so like if we change that word trauma also to stress Mm -hmm. in certain scenarios like that's it's important to have stress positive stress because we grow from it yeah yeah so it's it's com it's it's complex and complicated Mm -hmm. I think um I think yeah uh but again talking about PTSD that's a very specific experience that occurs from a result of um trauma plus some risk factors that Mm. may lead you to develop these symptoms Mm -hmm. yeah so then i'm thinking that for um resilience there might be protective factors like you were saying like social support or a sense of control um or you know therapy afterward access to therapy yeah absolutely Mm -hmm. and i think that that's what we would we want to help people who um experience these things find find their way to the to feeling to having these this resilience Mm -hmm. and to um manage or to feel yeah to feeling like they have control over their their lives and their trauma again and a lot of the trauma therapies that work that i've um heard of that are quite interesting have to do with reenactment oh yeah um so you really have to be in a like a 
good space. I would say you have to do a lot of therapy, individual therapy before doing that, but there are groups that get together and they'll with a therapist, of course, and they will reenact somebody's trauma. And so, for example, let's say your dad hit you. So they'll actually go make a scene and go back into it with all of the people in the group therapy and help the identified person that this happened to reenact everything and actually get to, um, to, for example, tell the mom what to say when the dad was hitting the kids. And then maybe that would Mm. like how they wished that it played out Mm -hmm. uh, or played out afterwards. And so that they can experience what that would be like. So those are very Mm. powerful therapies, um, for helping someone, uh, um, I wouldn't, I don't want to say resolve your trauma, but move forward with it. Yeah, yeah, to almost like build a new memory of it or to go through the motions of being in control and um, and being okay afterwards so that your body can feel like, okay, I've done that, I can do this, I can move forward. I mean, it's interesting because it kind of goes back to what you were talking about with the mastery of trauma, but then you actually have control because you're in a controlled environment and a safe environment. Right, right, yeah. That's really interesting. I've been exploring also um, a lot of somatic strategies or somatic therapies for uh, trauma recovery, which is really interesting because it's not talk-based. It's really just um, putting yourself in a situation or, well, for example, one of them I've done is called family constellations, where you might, um, you have a therapist or a guide who helps you to identify different uh, components of a situation that you want to get in touch with or connect with or move, create some movement through. And then they'll use objects to represent these different components. Mm. So you might have an object that represents you or an object that represents you as a child and an object that represents your trauma or an object that represents resilience. And then you have these objects in front of you and then you you just pay attention to what your body feels like when you focus on a certain object or focus on two objects being close to each other or in certain relationships to each other. And it's so fascinating how much that can help you to bring awareness of things that you weren't aware of before or help to just release grief or create some sort of movement that you can move past something so much more quickly than if you were just trying to talk about it. Yeah. I think what I really hear in that is like that, like a trauma gets stuck in your body Mm -hmm. and you need to get it out. Yeah. Yeah. And verbal, verbal therapy isn't necessarily the answer to that Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's not your body. Right. Right. Like Mm -hmm. even the reenactment that we're talking about, like, yes, that's reframing, but that's actually going through the motions. Mm -hmm. That's not just talking about like what I wish my mother had said. Yeah. You're really, you're actually going through it Mm. to get it out of your body. That's, and I also think it's interesting for you specifically because like being verbal was something that was difficult for you. So, so being, having like control over a scenario that's outside of your body, it probably felt really good compared mm-hmm. to like trying to talk about it. Absolutely. Yeah. And it helped it's me hard to reconnect to with my body. So I could be like, oh, I do feel things. I can <laughs> communicate with my body. I can yeah. recognize what I need and take action to meet my needs. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So there are, I mean, I think that the silver lining in all of this is that there are, um, there are very powerful therapies out there. I think that there's a lack of awareness about them, um, Mm -hmm. which I'm glad we're talking about them now, especially with related to trauma, because when I was a practicing therapist, I knew about these things. I knew that talk therapy actually doesn't really work for trauma. Mm. Um, And you got to get creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) And um, you got to get creative with the individual of how, how are we going to get this moving? How are we going to get this out? How are we going to, um, retell your story, I guess, but Mm. it doesn't have to be verbal. It doesn't have to be an actual verbal narrative. Yeah. Um, So I, and I think sadly, like a lot of times what we are doing to people with trauma is making people feel like it's their fault. 
Mm -hmm. um, even in our fields, which I think is sad, uh, that it's something wrong with you and your brain, but it's really mm -hmm. these memories, right. That are stuck with us, emotional memories, yeah. um, of something being done to us that like you, you just don't, you didn't have control over. So it gets stuck. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's, that's really sad. And then of course, you know, especially in America, um, giving medication is just like the go-to. Mm -hmm. And I have read studies about vets in particular that um, with PTSD that SSRIs, for example, work barely as well as a placebo. Like it oh, really okay. does not work for PTSD. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it can be a tool, but mm -hmm. that is not, it's definitely, it doesn't work the same as it does for um, depression and anxiety, for example. Mm -hmm. That's really important to know. Yeah. So what about dogs as a tool? Like, yeah. <laughs> like for veterans, it's a really big thing right now to, um, to seek out a, a service dog, psychiatric service dog for PTSD. There's actually a really cool, uh, uh, organization called canine for warriors in the U S where they take service or sorry, they take, uh, rescue dogs and they turn them into service dogs for mm -hmm. veterans. Uh, yeah. which I think is really neat. Mm, I have um, some ethical concerns about that, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, I don't know like, what the process is. But yeah, I'm sure it's a, I'm, I'm sure, sure there's a, a process, a vigilant <laughs> process. Of like, I, I would hope. Right. And um, a process that includes therapy for the dog before yes. they have to go and yeah. be a therapist for their uh, person. Well, I would hope that they do that. Um, I'm not sure how, what their process is like, but in theory, it's cool if, mm -hmm. <laughs> if it is being ethically done properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, it can be done really well and it can be a really beautiful story in a way to really help with dogs and humans at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, but we should look into it and mm -hmm. uh, maybe we can add a footnote about that here, actually, oh, I would yeah, like that because I've been meaning to look into them more. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so anyway, so that's, um, an example of an organization that helps match vets with uh, potential service dogs. Um, so a less lesser known type of service dog is a psychiatric service dog. Mm -hmm. And I think that they actually came about specifically for people with PTSD, but now um, I believe that they can also help people with uh, like pan pretty severe anxiety disorders um, and even depression, pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, as as the dog can do a specific task. That's what makes a dog a service dog is they have to perform a specific task that directly mitigates the symptoms or some component of the person's medical diagnosis. I have a question about that actually, probably because you know, you do know more about this, but um, a, so it has to be just one specific task. At um, least one. Yeah. At yeah. least one. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you can say that a dog um, interrupts nightmares, for example, mm. wakes, wakes up, mm -hmm. um, you know, a vet who's having nightmares, is that yeah. enough? That would be, be enough. That yeah. would be enough. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was my question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Good question. So that is something that I saw that uh, psychiatric service dogs, one of their tasks for people with PTSD can be um, waking up their handler. Is that a correct oh. terminology, by the way? Handler or like yeah. their handler. Is that okay? Yeah, you can call them handler or they're human. I like just- They're human. Okay, human. I prefer they're mm -hmm. human. I wasn't sure if that was mm -hmm. uh, okay or not. So they yeah. basically wake up their human from having a nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, and- other things they can do is provide pressure therapy if mm. uh, they're having a panic attack. So mm -hmm. that also can be for somebody who has panic attacks. Yeah. So like the dog sits on your lap or like even comes to you when you're in that state and then helps you to remember, oh, I need to sit down and you can be on my lap. Exactly. Yeah. It's so cool. Um, I think it's so cool. Mm -hmm. Dogs are amazing. Yeah. I get really yeah. excited when I read about these things. I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. they're just so amazing. Yeah. Um, how in touch they are with us uh, mm -hmm. in that way. Yeah. So I also um, saw that they can be trained to bring your medication. They uh, can. That one I feel is interesting because yeah. anytime we're using a 
dog to do a task to help us, we have to think about, is that the most practical way to do it? Is it the most efficient way? Is it the most financially economical way? Right? So like, (laughs) <laughs> what if you just set a timer on your cell phone to take your medication? <laughs> well, but what if you're yeah. having a panic attack? Mm, and it's like an as needed medication that you wouldn't yeah. take at a certain time. And also you're that a panic man and you can't get it. Yeah. That's happened to me, by the way, which is why I, oh, wow. I that's why yeah. I thought about it. Like mm-hmm. I've, I've been in a situation where I've had a panic attack and I'm like gasping for air and have, you know, I've had to be say to a friend, like, get me my Xanax, get me my Xanax. Mm, wow. So, I yeah. think about that. Mm-hmm. I think, that but I do see what you're sense. saying also. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that would be silly. I mean, they do because I I was reading about it for people with uh, diabetes, for example, that they bring yeah. in their medication. Right, mm-hmm. but I guess you they could also it, it's more like that they serve as a reminder. But you're right, like you could just put that on your phone. So yeah, yeah, or people have uh, continuous glucose monitors attached to their body that's always monitoring their sugar, or, right? You know, right, or right. dispensing insulin and things. So I think yeah, the dog can be yeah. a great backup. Or in these situations where something can't be given at a specific time because we don't know when it's going to be needed then the dog can be a great adjunct to other types of support to help you remember to do what you need to do to care for yourself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, like anything else, it's a tool and that's how we started this conversation also is how can a dog be a tool in helping people with PTSD? And these are in Mm -hmm. uh, various ways that they can do it. Yeah. Um, I want to reframe the idea of the dog being a tool though. I feel like I don't want to place dogs in a category of being an object or something that we use for ourselves. So right. think of them as like a partner, you know, like a, a partner, PTSD yeah. partner that supports you. I really like that, uh, mm-hmm. that idea of PTSD partner. It sounds yeah. like it would be a good, a good organization. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. PTSD partners. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. It's, uh, they are more than, I mean, they're living beings too, who also need to be taken care of. So they're not, um, just like popping a pill. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right. Right. Um, but, uh, what else, what else was I saying that they can do? Oh, uh, they can actually let people know when they are having, um, angry or emotional outbursts. Oh, like Uh, go get someone else to help to help or nudge them. So Mm. give them a signal like this is what's happening right now. Um, And also speaking of dissociation, they can disrupt uh, dissociative states or help disrupt Mm. them by nudging, Mm -hmm. Um, just giving a signal that this is happening. Because I think a lot of times when we're in that fight, flight, uh, freeze response, we we don't um, know what's happening, like what you were describing. Mm-hmm. So yeah. if you have a dog that's trained to be able to just come over and lick your hand and mm-hmm. say, hey, like, this is happening, right? Um, that might help you come out of it. Definitely. Yeah. Give you some sensation that to your body to help you feel your body um, and just help, yeah, help you to be more aware of what's going on with you so that you can track your sensations better you know, yeah. like sometimes we don't know we're in a panic attack until we're at the height of it. But yes, what if you could absolutely. know when it starts, like that moment that it begins before it gets to that overwhelming point, and then you can be like, oh, it's starting now because the dogs can tell, right? The dogs are so attuned to us and so they're so sensitive. They can tell when it starts when we might not be able to know until it gets really intense. Right. Absolutely. And I think Yeah. When we're kind of stuck in that trance, which I've talked about on here before, for example, when I'm upset and Duchess is licking my face, she snaps me out of it. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And she's not a service dog, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but that is something that she can do. But Mm -hmm. you know, that I I assume that that's what, what it could look like if they were trained to do it every time also. Mm Yeah. Um, I agree. Yeah. So that's among, there are so many, so many things, um, so many uh, tasks that they can learn to do. It's truly amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's important to say also on here, again, you probably have more to say about this, but uh, it's really important when thinking about a service dog, there's a couple things. One, they can be costly. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is financially 
can be, if you need one and you aren't able to financially afford one, like there are some organizations that um, help with that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I wish there were more because it's upsetting to think about that, you know, you have to have money in order to be able to benefit Mm -hmm. um, from a service dog, um, especially if it could be right for you. Mm -hmm. also not every dog is appropriate to be a service dog um that's uh so a lot of these organizations hopefully if they're doing everything right they are vetting you know what dog um what temperament of which dog is appropriate to to uh, actually be trained to be a service dog um and one of those things that i saw is really a willing a willingness and desire to work yeah um Duchess yeah. has no willingness or desire to do that. <laughs> I'm <Okay>. pretty sure. <laughs> so, um, but um, so that's important. Also, yeah, that's really important that they want to do it, that they have a choice. Yeah, that they want to. Yeah. And yeah. so I think that they, I, my understanding is, you know, if it's all properly vetted, that that's what something that they're looking for mm. as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting with choice. It's like the dog has to choose it initially, but also every day they should have a choice of whether or not they're doing that job. Like they can change their mind at any time or something could happen to the dog that traumatizes them or stresses them, you know? So I think we have to, like the dogs that are really good for this work, both want to do it and they have the ability to withstand stress. Cause if you're thinking about, yes. you know, the task of waking someone up from a nightmare or a panic attack, like those are really intense, stressful situations for the person experiencing it and for their dog. So the dog has to want to come back again the next night and do it again and feel safe doing that again and again. Absolutely. And also that they can tolerate, like it's a temperament that allows for a a tolerating like a wide variety of experiences, Yeah, including socializing. So because Mm. you're going to take your service dog everywhere, you know, they need to feel okay in many different situations and not every dog or human is right for that (laughs) yeah yeah Um, really asking a lot it is it is so there has to be like like a yeah like a high tolerance for for those situations where it doesn't bother them emotionally or or you know short periods of time in those situations doesn't bother them Mm -hmm. or they can recover you know right and are being taken care of of course also Mm-hmm. Yeah. And getting time off sometimes too. But on the flip side, we were also talking a little bit um, prior to recording this about how dogs could potentially um, trigger uh, trauma responses. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. I can tell you about that. Yeah. Um, especially dogs that have ex- like are recovering from trauma or that are reactive in some way. So I adopted Muggins a little over a year ago and I was um, recovering from trauma and was still like in a trauma brain, I would say, like a certain level of fear that prevented me from being completely aware of myself or prevented me from like having motivation to do certain things, but I was motivated to adopt a puppy. So I adopted Muggins (laughs) and (laughs) Muggins was, is reactive is reactive. And so um, Muggins will sometimes pull on the leash. And Muggins also really loves people and other dogs. They love meeting people and other dogs. Um, Side note, I've been using they, them pronouns for Muggins as a way to just practice using them for myself. Really good idea. (laughs) I noticed that. I was like, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Also, we should probably uh, do that for all dogs because yeah. Why do we gender the dogs? <laughs> right. I, exactly. I, yeah. <laughs> so that with a dog named Duchess, I don't know if I can do that. Oh, come well. on. They could be a Duchess. <laughs> I know. So, yeah. So well, it reacts um, both by getting really excited to see other people and also to, by sometimes barking a lot, like getting really startled all of a sudden and um, going into that fight response. 
So at the, at the, the time that I was first learning to deal with that, I was experiencing my own trauma responses, which were related partially to myself as a professional because I experienced trauma in grad school as I was becoming a professional. And so there was this dynamic where on the one hand, like having my own dog be so reactive and like drag me down the street or bark at other people or dogs, I felt very, I felt a lot of shame. Like mm -hmm. I can't be a professional um, who works with dogs because my dog doesn't behave well. So there was that, almost that fear of being seen as an incapable dog owner. Mm -hmm. And because Muggins was reacting to other people and dragging me or pulling me down the street, Muggins was not seeing me. So I had this uh, weird dynamic where I needed to be seen by Muggins because that was how we were going to stay safe walking through the neighborhood. And I also wanted to be seen as a competent professional. And so there was yeah, Muggins was dragging me, which was literally um, impacting my sense of safety because I could fall down or he could pull me into, they could pull me into the street or up to another dog who's not friendly. And also just like Muggins isn't seeing me. I'm not seen. I'm invisible. This sense that like yeah. I'm invisible. I don't matter. No one can see how capable I am. And also I'm scared because I don't have control over my physical body right now. So I would go into a trauma response. So I would either freeze or I would go into a fight and I would get really mad at Muggins and yell at them, or I would freeze and not say anything and just like turn around and like walk home. Um, and then I would get stuck in that mindset. Like mm -hmm. after I was home, after the walk, I couldn't snap out of it. I couldn't talk about it with my partner or if my partner had a similar experience, I would get mad at him because I'm like, see, you're making it harder for me, you know? And so I was just, I was isolating myself. And also I was isolated because I couldn't connect with other people when I was walking with Muggins. And I was not able to connect with my own partner um, about the issue because I couldn't talk about it. And I couldn't find a way to empathize with his experience, even though it was similar to mine. So it was this like tornado of isolation and shame and not being seen and feeling just really scared all the time. Yeah, that's pretty intense, like mm -hmm. to have these symptoms and then they just get heightened by um, having muggins. Yeah. Um, but, you know, be reactive also. Mm -hmm. um, I also imagine like bar the barking can be very startling. And if you're in a hyper vigilant state, often um, you're going to really like, it'll give you, you know, for lack of better words, a heart attack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, already a lot. yeah the, all of a sudden Muggins is barking or an alarm bark at something. Yeah. And, and you're I'm already just, on, ah! so it's like, <gasps> you know, yeah. Um, so that is really difficult. And it, and it's interesting though, because it, it's also his temperament mm -hmm. paired with yours. And, yeah. you know, like most relationships, sometimes things don't jive. And mm -hmm. so it's how, how do we figure that out? Yeah. Um, and you obviously have. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> to a certain point. <laughs> you okay. and in your, you with them. Yeah. In your relationship with them. Mm -hmm. I think that you, you too, I, like I see that it's obviously continue to to develop and grow but um it yeah. seems like you both have have figured out how to live with each other's trauma responses because he also has ptsd yeah. yeah yes as you might hear right now yeah. <laughs> yeah well and oh go ahead i was gonna say it was a. Uh, it has taken a lot of work and it's still work you know like i think part of the uh difficulty with trauma recovery is that it's I don't I don't know that it ends you know it's ongoing it's it's learning a new lifestyle a new way of caring for myself and being in the world um, but that doesn't mean it's 
you never see results. You know what I mean? Like, I think I started to see results right away. As soon as I started getting help for myself and working with therapists and different uh, somatic providers and really focusing on my sleep and eating and my daily routine. Um, and it's, it's supporting muggins in the same ways, you know, making sure muggins has a good eating and sleeping routine and that they learn certain skills and that they have opportunities to play and feel safe and, and all of that. So it's really like so, helping both of us and then having us come together and help each other. I think that's so powerful, you know, um, and that's the thing. I mean, we talked about service dogs and what they can do and, that does feel very one-sided. Mm. Um, and, you know, then we can talk about like Muggins as a pet, like more in that role and, you know, how, how you, he still, they still helped you so much develop um, and helped your mental health so much, but mm -hmm. in a different way. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and you helped them so much. And of course, with the service dogs, like we're also talking about it in one way, like every relationship is different. Every dog and human is different that, that have that relationship. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting that, it, you know, again, like you don't have to have a service dog to benefit from the relationship that you can have with one and what they can do for your mental health, even if it seems difficult at first. And that's another way of saying like, okay, this was, you were being re-traumatized, but you came out of it and, and found mastery over it. And he was being re-traumatized too. Muggins was being re-traumatized, but you guys found a way to come out of it where you both have a sense of control. Um, an agency. I want to use the word agency that you yeah. both have your own sense of agency over your body and behaviors. <laughs> mm, yeah. I like that reframe to agency. Yeah. Cause I think that's exactly what I have tried to cultivate for Muggins is their sense of agency through giving them choices and how I teach them to communicate and, um, and then also giving myself a sense of agency by reconnecting with my body and prioritizing listening to my body over listening to other people or what society says I'm supposed to do or, you know, things like that. So it's really a, um, an ability to set boundaries and to recognize what I need and then take action to get what I need. Yeah, absolutely. And that helped you. I mean, you learned that through Muggins also more. Mm -hmm. Well, it was like, I learned it. I learned it with the therapists and the guides that I've worked with. Of and course, then yeah. Muggins gave me opportunity to practice it. Oh, uh, okay. I like that. You know? So it's like yeah. by working with Muggins in, in the way that I have and through co-regulation and consent, I'm practicing the skills that I need to use in other places in my life. That's amazing. That's mm -hmm. really, that's such a unique story to use of how putting everything together can turn out mm -hmm. and yeah. can have a positive outcome when we're talking about the human dog relationship mm -hmm. and our mental health. Yeah. Yeah. Our collective mental health. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think I always try to figure out like, well, with dogs, you know, as a, as an OT and as someone who, um, went to school because I was really into animal assisted interventions, I'm always recognizing the opportunities that dogs provide us with, and then trying to figure out like, okay, what could a human and a dog do together? That's going to benefit both of them, you know, yeah. in, a, in a therapeutic way or in just a life, wonderful living life kind of way. Yeah. I, and that's so important. Like we want to all mutually benefit and flourish, um, mm -hmm. from whatever relationships we engage in. Yeah. I would hope. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to lead us through an aftercare tip. This is a somatic exercise, which just means that it's body based and it targets, uh, the nervous system and helps the nervous system to find a calmer grounded state. And so this exercise is called tapping. And I'm just going to teach you one tapping point, which is the third eye point, which is right between your eyebrows. Um, you can like press that point if you want to, to see what it feels like. 
But for the tapping, you're just going to take one finger. It can be your pointer or your middle finger or your ring finger, depending on how much pressure you want. And you're just going to start tapping that spot. While you're doing that, breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. In through your nose. and out through your mouth. So you can, I'm gonna talk a little bit while we're doing this. You can keep tapping if you like that. Um, some ways to know that you might benefit from tapping are you feel like crying. Um, you're having a hard time taking a deep breath. Um, you're venting, you get home and you want to vent to your partner or your mom or your parent or a friend and you want to uh, vent and get it out of your body. Um, you, your dog just dragged you down the street and you need to regroup before you continue. Um, your dog just startled you um, by barking out the window and you need to take a few deep breaths. Tapping combined with breathing is like, um, it like enhances the breathing because it gets your nervous system to be back in a rhythm and helps you to feel your body. So it could be great if you're feeling like your head is floating out of your body or you're like, I can't feel my body. Or if you're in a freeze and you can't think of what something to say or you feel like you're trapped. And there are many tapping points, correct? Yeah, yeah, there are. They can coincide with the chakras. If you're familiar with yoga chakras, um, they, this one coincides with the third eye chakra, which is an energy point between your eyebrows. But sometimes when you're first learning tapping, just knowing one tapping point is a great place to start. And it's really simple. You just find that point. And you can stop whenever, whenever it feels like you want to stop, like if your arm is tired and you want to put it down, or if you're like, it doesn't feel good anymore, you might want to like rub that spot and give it a different sensation. Or you might um, like wipe, wipe the energy away from your face or your head, just take both hands and kind of like wipe down your shoulders and your arms. And then you can shake it out a little bit. <laughs> get it out, get the energy mm -hmm. out. Yeah. Cool. I really like that. I've um, only ever done tapping once. I think it's, uh, it's interesting. And it, it, a lot of people swear by it, that it really works for them. So mm -hmm. it has changed my yeah. whole life. Okay. Yeah. Among, <laughs> I mean, among many other things that also have, but tapping yeah. is so good for me. That's, that's really awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe you can tell us more about it in the footnotes. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, and where we can learn more about it also. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that wraps up our third episode. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe we have a part two or we move on into talking about dogs and PTSD next week, which is a very different conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about how it, it, what it looks like in them and uh, how to help them um, through that experience. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Looking forward to that conversation. Even though we are licensed professionals in our own field of work, Angela, LCSW, Sharon, OTD, and CDBC, this podcast is not intended to replace individual therapy for humans or behavior support for dogs. We approach our conversations from an exploratory, observational, and strictly personal lens. If you are struggling with your mental health, your dog's behavior, or if you or your dog have experienced a recent traumatic event, please see the resources section on our websites for a list of resources and places that can help. Visit either www.hc-collab.com slash happy dog, happy human, 
or www.clouddoodles.com slash happy dog, happy human. For additional show notes, including books and articles that we mentioned, please check out the footnotes section on our websites. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to support the show, go to buymeacoffee.com slash HDHH podcast and send us a few bucks so that we can stay awake and energized to make more content. This podcast is made possible by the collaboration between Cloud Doodles and Human Canine Collaborative. Check out our websites at www.clouddoodles.com or www.hc-collab.com. Special thanks to Tom Fox at Tom Fox Photos for support with editing and production consulting. You can find Tom at tomfoxphotos.com. Also special, special thanks to sound effects and story examples from Duchess and Muggins. We could not and would not ever want to do this without you.